the Lord a hand clap of praise. Just remain standing with me one, one more quick moment for Joshua chapter 1. Then we're going to be flipping over to Acts chapter 2. I'm going to read quickly for us tonight. Joshua chapter 1 beginning in verse 10. It reads like this, Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host, and command the people, saying, Prepare your victuals, for within three days ye shall pass over this Jordan and go and in, go into possess the land. Turn to your neighbor and say, The land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. Verse 12, and to the Reubenites, and to the Gadites, and to half of the tribe of Manasseh spake Joshua, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest, and hath given you this land. Your wives and your little ones, your cattle, shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side, of the Jordan. But ye shall pass before your brethren, armed all the mighty men of valor, and help them. Say, help them. Until the Lord have, have given your brethren rest as he hath given you, and they, and they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth them. Then ye shall return unto the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses, the Lord's servant, gave you on this side of the Jordan toward the sun rising. And they answered Joshua, saying, All that thou commandest us we will do, and whithersoever thou sendest us we will go. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 37. Now when they had heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remissions of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. God, we thank you for your word and its anointing. We ask that it go forth in that anointing and power in Jesus' name. And the church says amen, and you may be seated tonight. Two very different portions of scripture, but I want to bring to light to you the one underlining thing that these scriptures have in common. Joshua chapter 1, many of us have heard that taught and preached on many different ways, but I want you to realize that Moses has passed on, the generation that has wandered in the wilderness has passed on, all but Joshua and Caleb, they're the ones that remain. And now God is speaking to Joshua and he's saying, now Moses is dead, you're to lead the people into the land that I have promised them. Turn to your neighbor and say, promised promised. He, he, he said, you're the one to lead them into the land that I promised them. And we find in the, the portion of scripture that we read, Joshua begins to tell the people, hey, listen, he tells the officers, get to your tribes, tell everybody that we are going to go into the land in the next, within the next three days. And they do so. But we find also that he tells the Reubenites, the Gadites, and half of the tribe of Manasseh. He says, listen, I understand this, and I, I want you, this is a teaching moment here, to realize that the land on the other side, they're on the wrong side, technically, of the Jordan. But for the Reubenites and the Gadites and half of the tribe of Manasseh, that was the land that was promised to them by God 
through Moses. So their land was not on the other side of the Jordan. It was on the side of the Jordan they were already on. But I want you to notice what Joshua instructs them to do. He says, now listen, I I know that this is your land, but I want you to realize that you told Moses that you would send your mighty men of valor to fight and help us possess our land. So we see that there is a coming together. There is a unifying factor. You, you flip over to Acts chapter 2. We come into the pretty much punchline, if you will, of, of Peter's message on the day of Pentecost. He tells them that they need to be baptized for the remissions of sins, uh, that they, they, need to, uh, they, they can be offered the gift of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he tells them in verse 39 uh, that this is the promise that... That is to you and to your children and to all those afar off. Turn, turn to your neighbor again. Say the promise, the promise, the promise. So we hear God has promised them land in Joshua chapter one uh, and and throughout uh, the 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 books, the beginning books of the Bible, and we we see that. But I want you to understand that on the day of Pentecost was the fulfillment of a promise that was given by Christ and by the prophet Joel. But I want you to also realize that on the day of Pentecost, uh, there was again a coming together and a unification that took place in order to obtain the promise. I want to preach to you tonight on my promise. My promise. This is this is a very unusual portion of, of Scripture for me, but I, I, I really want... Uh, and very unusual to tie together, but I really want to divulge what the Lord has given me tonight. So I'm I'm just going to obey the Lord and get out of the way. But I want to point out the fact that I have noticed something throughout. How many how many people's been raised in church? There's a lot of people been raised in church in this house. Just wave your hand in the air, like yeah, you know, I've been raised in church. Yeah, okay, slept under the pews, been whipped in the bathroom, all that. Um. So I, I've been raised in church. I was drugged to church. I was, you know, I, 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 all those things. I was raised in, in, in this. But I have found in my 28 years on this earth that as I've gotten older, Brother Chris, that I, I see slowly that there is a fading away of fellowship and community in the church. We're so busy now, Sister Becky, that we, we, we have a hard time getting together and staying together. You know, it's one thing to come together for a service, but, but I, I, I tell you, it's so easy to leave quickly. You got things to do. You got places to be. I, I understand that. I, I, I go through some of those things uh, myself. And, and I, I've realized that the church as a whole in this nation, and I thank God for this church, but the church as a whole in the nation, there is this lack of community. And I want you to understand that you don't get community without the latter half of that word, which is unity. You don't have community without unity, and you don't have the unity in community without calm, which is the communication. There has to be a coming together in order for the promises of God to be obtained. There has to be a coming together in unity and fellowship in community in order for the promises of God to be obtained. Here's what I want you to understand that this devil, this adversary, this wicked one that we call him, he is the prince in the power of the air and he is influencing this world as as what we would call in, in the form of what we would call the antichrist spirit. He is anti-Christ. He is anti the anointed one. So I believe that that many people uh, and many preachers have have divulged many things of why they believe that the the church in America is in the shape that it's in. And and many people have have talked about uh, what COVID did to the church and that many churches aren't aren't, aren't seeing the comeback that they thought they would. I thank God that we're seeing more than a comeback and we're seeing new faces. I thank God for that. But I I, I want to just, just... relay this to you because the Bible tells us as the end draws near in Hebrews chapter 10 that we are not to forsake one another 
but we are to assemble more together. But the enemy, what he has done with our culture and influencing our culture, we feel that we have to be involved in everything and what lacks. And I'll tell you, my my father has told me this for years, uh, but I realize that he said, when your life gets busy, what's the first thing that gets cut out? He said, church. Church is the first thing that gets cut out. He said, you could take a day off work. You could get stuff done. But no, you'll do it on a church night. He said, it's always been that way. I don't, I don't understand why. But, but we have become so busy as people of God because we've become so influenced by the culture. We don't even realize that we're not coming into unity. I want you to hear me because the enemy knows that if he can stop unity and people from coming together, he can stop the promises of God from coming forth. I want you, I'm going to divulge all this, I'm going to lay this all out to you tonight. The enemy knows that when the people of God get together, there is not only unity, there is a power and there is an anointing that begins to flow because God begins to usher in his presence and his glory and his power and things begin to happen. So the enemy tries to use our culture, our daily life to keep us from coming in together in unity and community and fellowship because he knows that he He can hinder the purpose and the promises of God if he hinders our fellowship. You you following me? Am I making any sense? I'm, I'm, I'm going somewhere tonight. The Bible tells us in John chapter 14, John chapter 16, Jesus said that there is a promise of the Holy Spirit that is coming. And they they knew that something was coming because of what was written in the book of Joel in in chapter 2. When he said that in the last days saith God that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. We find that on Acts chapter 2 that Peter stands up in verse 14. And he says in verse 15 that these men are not drunken as you suppose. And he says in verse 16 he says but this is that which is spoken of by the prophet Joel. He's saying what has happened is because we've become in unity in an upper room and we've come in obedience to God. What has happened is power has come upon us and is now flowing out of us. And I want you to realize what happens on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls get saved. What happens in Joshua chapter 1? This land has been promised to them since Abraham. What happens to them? is they go into the promised land and in Joshua chapter 6 they shout with a great shout and the walls come tumbling down. We preach that all the time. But I want you to realize that we don't get Joshua chapter 6 in the victory and the stronghold coming down without the coming together in Joshua chapter 1. So you say, what does this have to do with my promise? What, 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 I don't, I don't understand what this has to do with my promise. Joshua chapter 1. Joshua says, okay. And here, here's what we're so good at doing in, in church. And, and listen, I, I'm all for, you shouldn't be nosy. Shouldn't gossip. No, you shouldn't do any of those things. I want to I want to give this to you the way the Lord gave this to me. So Matty, he says, so the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half of the tribe of Manasseh, you're about to fight and could possibly die for a land that's not yours. Let me put it to you in 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 just layman's terms. It's not your house. It's not your children. It's not your cattle. It's not your harvest. It's not, it's he, he, he's saying, I understand that the land is not yours. This is your land. But here's what I want to get to the church. It may not be your children. It may not be your home. But there's someone that you're going to church with on Sunday morning, on Wednesday night, uh, that you're going on an Easter egg hunt with uh, on Saturday uh, afternoon. There's someone that is trying to obtain the promises of God. And I want you to realize this tonight. It was not their land, but it was still their promise. 
it was not their child strung out on drugs, uh, but it was still their promise. Here's what I I want want you to understand tonight uh, is it may not be your child going through it. Uh, It may be your neighbor sitting on your left and on your right. Uh, But when you look at their child, I want you to realize, uh, hey, it's not my kid. Uh, Okay, I understand that. But God, uh, you said in Acts chapter 2 and verse 39 uh, that this promise uh, is for me and for my children and for all those afar off. Uh, It may not be my land. Uh, It may not be my my home but their child is still part of my promise I want you to get this he says in Joshua chapter 1 he says here here I want you to realize this Reubenites Gadites half the tribe of Manasseh here's what I want you to understand is that you're going to have to fight for this thing it's not your land I understand that but they said we will go where you tell us to go we will do what you tell us to do we will fight for our brothers we will fight for our sisters we will fight for our countrymen we will fight for those and linked up faith with us I want you to know it's about time that the church started coming together in unity and said you know what I'll fight for your children I'll fight for revival I'll fight for something to change in your church I'll fight for something to change in this community it may not be happening at your house but I want you to know that drug addict that you pass in Walmart that they're still part of your promise they may not be your daughter they may not be your son but there's someone's son there's someone's daughter and this promise that we read of in Acts chapter 2 it's for them it's for me it's for you it's for your children so it's about time we come together and you say you know what your promise is my promise your goal is my goal your prayer is my prayer your fasting is my fasting we're going to come together in unity and we're going to watch power and anointing begin to flow I'm almost done I promise so here's what's crazy we we preach about anointing and we shout we hoot and holler unity's awesome unity's going to cost you some things can't get offended we live in a world of offense everybody gets offended by something they get offended, they get offended by somebody getting offended by what they said that offended them. It just don't make no sense. They just get offended. Well, I was offended. I was offended. Listen, it's going to cost you to put your pride on the side and say, you know what, they probably didn't even mean it that way. And, and we get so tripped up on, on the detail. I, I, I want you to understand that what the devil's trying to do is he's trying to get you from coming into unity. Marriage, relationships, hear me tonight. He's trying to interrupt your unity. Why? Why? Psalms 133. Landon, can you get Psalms 133 up here? I I want everybody to see this. I know you're working with one hand. Oh, camera's helping him out. We're good. That's unity. So Psalms 133. A song of decrees of degrees of David. Behold how good And how pleasant, don't go to verse 2 yet, how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. He says it's good, it's pleasant, it's right. Okay, but what is anointing like, or what what is unity like? Go to verse 2. It is like the precious ointment. You want to know what that ointment is? If you read in Leviticus 8 and 12, what happened was Moses took a bottle of anointing oil and dumped it all over Aaron. He said, unity is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, and went down to the skirts of his garment. That's that's good. Thank you. Unity brings about anointing. And anointing, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 10 and 27, that the anointing will destroy the yoke. So why does the devil fight you coming in unity? Is because when unity is achieved in the church house, freedom is won in the schoolhouse. 
in the White House, in the courthouse, in the jailhouse. When unity is achieved in the church house, yokes begin to come off of your house. Oh, I want you to hear me tonight. I know it's Wednesday and you want me to be quiet and you want me to sit down and you want to get a place to eat. I understand that. I'm hungry too. But I want you to get this tonight. That when we come together and we put aside the day we've had, we put aside what everybody said, what somebody tweeted, what someone posted, what a politician said. When we put all that aside and we step into a worship service and we say, God, we're here to come together in unity. God, why? Why is that? so important because when 120 people got in unity on the day of Pentecost 3,000 souls got saved. When a nation came together in unity in the book of Joshua they cried and they shouted and they pled they just began to cry out to God and a stronghold fell down that was in their way. Here's what I want you to understand. There were men on, on that battlefield it wasn't their land it wasn't their kids it wasn't their home it wasn't their problem they probably shouldn't have been there but they shouted just like everybody else shouted because they were saying your victory is my victory your win is my win church it's about time that we come back together in unity and realize that your promise is my promise to come to the music, please. It's 13 years old. I was 13 years old. And I knew that God was calling me to do something. I knew that God was calling me to do something. There's been a few times in my life I've heard the audible voice of God, and I remember I was sitting in our church, Bread Life Ministries, State Road 122, Lebanon, Ohio. It was a Wednesday night. My dad was up there preaching. I was on the front row. And Katie, I heard, I'm dead serious, I heard a voice say, you're going to do that someday. I thought for sure my mom was behind me or something. Yeah, Being mom. No, nobody was behind me. person on my left was all the way down to the end of the row. I remember a few weeks later I was in a youth revival. A youth rally. At Corin Pentecostal Church outside of Waynesville, Ohio. And there's a man, I, I've only seen him one other time. I, he, he was a minister, I know that much. He came and he prophesied over me and he said, The Lord's called you to do something, are you going to do it? And I knew I was called to preach, I was scared to death. So I run from it. But about seven years ago, Started in youth ministry. Got you know many of you know my testimony through my mom's passing. The Lord just ministered to me, and I had an encounter, just like unlike any other I've ever had in my life. And the Lord changed my life, and I gave Him all of me. But you know, brother Chris, for many years, first two or three years of youth ministry, I was doing it because I knew I was called to it. And I loved the Lord and I wanted to be obedient and I loved the kids. But something began to change and, and my love for them just began to grow and grow and grow. and My love for the ministry, my love for everything just began to grow and grow and grow. And I never really knew why. I just figured, okay, God's increasing. That's great. That's awesome. But a few weeks ago when the Lord spoke this to me, He said, what you're doing, Jade? He says, it's not your land, but these kids are still your promise. I was like, what? 
They ain't my kids. But you know what? Carly Cavins is still my promise, just like it's her parents' promise. The promise for her is the same for her parents, the same for me, is that you can be saved, set free, filled with it. He told them on the day of Pentecost, this is the promise. This is what Joel was talking about. And I began to realize that even though these kids weren't my kids, they were still my promise. And when you get texts in the middle of the night, you get phone calls in the middle of the night, I never realized it all these years. But when the Lord began to speak to me, He said, that's your promise. That's your promise. It's not your land. It's your promise. I hope the parents in this house know, I'll fight for your kids just like you'd fight for your kids. I was telling somebody the other day, they said, ask how many, ask how many kids I have. I said, I have, I have two girls. I said, adopted, I have about 30 But I want you to understand, it, it don't have to be. I'm, I'm not saying you got to be all up in somebody's business. But if, 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 the, if, if, if Sister Sarah Mullins is going through and she's just warned for one of her daughters, she better believe that I'm going to be in the trench with her. Me and Sarah's going to be right there. We're going to be praying just as hard as she's praying. Why? It's not my kid. Oh, you shouldn't. You just mind your business. No, listen, I don't need to know what's going on. But, but if she was fighting for one of her kids, I'm going to let her know that, hey, your promise is still my promise. What your kid means to you, I, I want it to mean that much to me. I want to fight for you like I'd fight for my own family. That's what they did in Joshua chapter 1. They said, if you ask us to die, pretty much, we'll die. Because it's still my promise. So I said all that to let you know that we, we've got to come together not just on Sunday, not just on Wednesday, but I'm saying we got to come into this house. And when we enter in worship, we've got to come into unity. Put the day, put the day away. I know, I know there's, there's distractions. There's all kinds of things going on. Listen, I know what it's busy. But it's busy, busy, busy. Everybody's busy. Listen, we're, we're all busy. We're all busy. Everybody is. But I want you to realize that that busyness is being used by the enemy to prevent you from coming into unity so anointing will not flow. Because anointing sets people free. So if you stand across this house, We're having a special weekend. It's, 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 it's Easter weekend. We're going to have festivities on Saturday. That's awesome. It's great. But our pastor is going to stand behind this sacred desk on Sunday morning. He's going to deliver a word from the Lord. And I guarantee you there's going to be people in here that normally would not be in here. This is the one of two services they go to to keep their mom or grandma off their back. And what they need, Sister Katie, is not a show. They don't need the worship team to entertain them. That's not what we're here to do anyway. They don't need Pastor Ronnie to preach them happy. No, 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 no. What they need is for the church to come into unity so the Spirit of God can step down and say, okay, now anointing can flow. Now, now yokes can be broken. Now the chains can fall off. Now the sinner can be found. Now, 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 now the addict can be set free. So I want us to come into this house on Sunday morning, not just in unity, but with the mindset is that that person that may be here that's not normally here, there's somebody's promise. So they're my promise too. They may not be mine, but they're my promise. They may not be mine, but they're still my promise.
And I pray that the Holy Spirit just falls. We see people radically saved and transformed by the power of the Holy Ghost. That's what I want to see. But it starts on a Wednesday night. Getting our mind right. Because there's going to be a lot of opportunities for distractions. Many of you are going to have dinners afterwards. you got family coming over. There's lots of room for distractions. But I'll tell you what that family needs more than your chicken dinner. Is the Holy Ghost. What my family needs more than that steak that I want to throw on the grill on Saturday. Praise God. What they need is revival. 